Finally, we're going to see some meaningful national level cricket. It's been a long time coming and it's an understatement to say that a lot has gone on in the meantime, both positive and negative. But the point of this discussion is to focus on the men's U19 national championships this week in Prairie View, Houston. Participating in this conversation is Peter De La Pena from ESPN Crick Info and longtime USA Cricket enthusiast, Dave Jagannath, and myself, Nate Hayes, contributor with Emerging Cricket. We've come together to discuss the coming week of competition, and this will be kind of a high-level overview of what's happening. As the week goes on, there will be more and more people included in these conversations. I hope to have the likes of Zonal Volunteers, USA Cricket Personnel, and Smith Patel from Crick Buzz. Fingers crossed, but hopefully some Zonal coaches as well. Dave Jay's in the middle of a Uber shift, so we're going to start with uh, Peter. Uh, Peter Delapena literally just walked off of his flight, his first one in 14 months. And the big question is, did you choose Chick-fil-A or the old reliable five guys for dinner tonight? Got to go with the old reliable. It was the uh, small fries at the airport from McDonald's that, that did it for you, huh? I was, I was left with a sour taste in my mouth at O'Hare on my connecting flight, so uh, I had to had to cleanse the palate with some good fresh five guys fries so i'm all i'm all fattened up now ready to go so 23 hours of no no sleep plus five guys fries i'm sure you're uh, being pretty tempted by that bed yeah can't wait to put my head down later <laughs> it's been pointed out on uh facebook recently by a, by a few people that while this is the first U19 national championships under USA Cricket, USACA held national championships for this age group with uh, a similar zonal structure. Is that correct? Don't you dare tarnish the memory of USACA, Nate. How dare <laughs> you try to snub USACA and all the great memories of the USACA era by <laughs> calling this the first ever USA under-19 national championships. So I, I, I take it you saw some of those posts then? Yeah. Many people who, on a serious note, there were some good efforts and, and positive contributions that were made in the past. And I, I know those people don't want to have their efforts neglected or forgotten, which is more than fair. But yes, this is the first official under-19 championships of the new governing body, the new era in American cricket. And hopefully it is a positive experience start of some good momentum in terms of on-field activities because there haven't really been much of anything on field domestically or internationally with regards to American cricket and this is the first domestic championships that USA cricket has organized there's been so much emphasis on the quote quote high performance in USA men's national team USA women's national team USA under 19 national team USA cricket sent an under 19 squad to Toronto in 2019 but all of these things were done basically in, in siloed environments with just a series of trials compared to the past in the USACA structure where you had zonal championships, national championships where each team would send a regional side. This is the first true match play domestic event organized by USA Cricket. And I think a lot of people are very excited about it. And a lot of people are going to be casting a very keen eye to see not just the players, and, and evaluate the players' performances. But from an administrative standpoint, I know there are definitely going to be some people chomping at the bit to compare the organizational aspects of, of what's being done in the upcoming week compared to how it was done in USACA. And is it better? Is it worse? Is it more of the same? Has anything truly changed? So there'll be, there'll be many things that people will be paying attention to this week, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I think it's going to be a really interesting week. I think with the lack of any real significant games over the last 13 plus months, almost 14 months now, I think that it's going to bring extra scrutiny, perhaps. It has that potential at least. And I'm really looking forward to it. I know, I know a lot of people are watching this with a lot of anticipation. So some of the, some of the interesting storylines uh, surrounding the Nationals, um, the, the Colts concept, the, 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 the team is zone independent. So it's got players from all zones or even no zones in some cases. Four members of the Colts were on minor league exhibition rosters. Three of those players attended the Major League Elite Youth Camp. One other player also attended the Major League Elite Youth Camp. So there are some notable names in, in that regard. Another notable name, uh, Slade Van Staden. Uh, one, he's a one-time South African U19 hopeful. He's been named as the captain of the Colts. Peter, I we've seen a bit of a reaction to him leaving South Africa 
on Twitter that's kind of been a bit of a surprise. What do you what do you make of that? Well, what I found kind of comical is that without being crude to some other players who have represented USA, there is kind of a stigma that when players are, are coming from overseas who are dual citizens or qualifying on residence here or what have you, the stigma has been players who come to play for USA from overseas, born and brought up somewhere else, and they qualify another way. The stigma is, oh, these guys are second-rate players, and um, they're only coming to play for USA because they, they failed in their home country. And the reaction for Slave and Staden is basically like, please don't leave us. Please stay in South Africa. What, what are you? What are you doing? Why is Why is this guy leaving? No, no, this guy is like gonna be a future like Brody great. Oh my God, what What the hell is going on? Like South Africa uh, cricket, South Africa is really screwed up if they let uh, Slave and Sutton leave and go to the USA. And it's like, oh, people instead of instead of being ambivalent about a player leaving or or like good riddance, it's no, no, please come back. No, where are you going? <laughs> Don't leave us. So that hints at the fact that this guy's a blue chip prospect. If you look at his stats, for the people who aren't familiar with him and, and his his reputation, this guy has scored a mountain of runs in South Africa schools cricket. The the school that he has uh, attended Hilton or something. I want to say yeah, Hilton sounds right. It, it's it's a school that has produced. Uh, players for South Africa. I think the most recent one is Lungi and Gidi, I think is, is going there. It's got a solid reputation for producing South African players. And this guy has scored at least eight or nine centuries in the last two years at this high level uh, school team in the schools competition out in and around Durban. Again, it, in American cricket and junior cricket, people get excited about half centuries. It's like, oh, this guy scored like eight fifties. Ooh, that's like special. And it, oh, he scored one century. Like, oh wow, and he's really good. There's a different standard over there. You don't get right. excited about one century. You, get, you, you, you know, one century is like, oh great, well done. This guy is scoring, uh, I think, four or five, six centuries in a season. And I think without without setting expectations too high for him, it's exciting the things that can be found on him. The evidence is there that uh, this guy is potentially a solid, solid prospect for for USA, especially from the standpoint, if you judge by the reactions from the people in South Africa who have seen him growing up there and were expecting him to play for South Africa, um, right. they're, they're already missing him. So that, that's, that's, uh, that bodes well. And hopefully, um, without, again, putting too high expectations or undue pressure on him, I think um, – People are really, really excited to see what he produces as the captain of the Colts team this week. We'll see for sure. Got to adapt right away to a new wicket. He's got to deal with the pressure of captaining a, a team full of people he's just going to meet pretty much. So there's, a, there's some pressure on him as well. So if he does come out and, and scores runs and, and performs big, that to me, that says an awful lot about his caliber. But there's, there's a lot of obvious questions left unanswered. And amongst those, uh, he seems to be a, a passionate cricket player. I mean, you kind of have to be to, to score those heaps of runs. Like you said, you got to really li- live and breathe it. I'm sure he's aware of the history of, of his country in South Africa. And if he is, if he does become a great player, another question is how, how long will he stick around if he stays here? So let's, let's see. All those things are, are, are yet to be answered. We'll definitely be, be watching that. Another interesting thing I noticed is Arna Vier, on the Colts. He was on a minor league team. He, he was in the major league camp in the first group, which was the stronger group, but he's on the Colts team. He's not on either of the West teams. And this is interesting to me. He, he kind of has a reputation for being a, a good player. I know I, I mentioned this to, to Dave before. And it looks like he's uh, got a little break from his Ubering. Well, Dave, what, what do you think? Like I said, everybody, I know a lot of the players that Major League Academy was talking up doesn't necessarily mean that's the same way USA Cricket look at, at, at those players. Right, right. You know, the just because they were in the main team, it doesn't mean they're in the, the main eyes of the USA, or, you know, set up. But again, like I tell, uh, like I said, this tournament will showcase who is who. This is why one of, this is why I'm always calling for tournaments like these 
to, you know, everybody always say, hey, we have all these good players here. Well, in order for them to know how good they are, we need tournaments like these. You know, and this is where they get a chance to prove who they who they actually are. You know, there's such good players here in Mid-Atlantic, and I'm pretty sure you will ask me which ones I think of are New York. This That's because I know them here. They haven't sure. gotten a chance to, to showcase their talent against the West Zone or the Midwest Zone, South, uh, the, the Texas team. You, right. you know, they play individual players. They have played against like a few players, but never the, a full force of the Texas guys, you know, or the California yeah. guys. Yeah, this is kind of a new thing for this generation here to, to be able to compete against each other in their zones. Right. I think the last time these guys actually compete against them uh, like this was maybe a few years ago at a very, uh, maybe under 15, I think 2016 in Chicago. Yeah. Well, one of the things that Dave touched on there that I, I think is a good point I know I've been critical at times of, of Ace, but I, I'm generally, uh, I would say, positive that they are organizing things and trying to develop infrastructure, which is clearly a benefit, and, and providing opportunities in that sense through, through minor league and major league. There's no, there's no such thing as, as too much cricket being played. So the fact that players are getting opportunities to play is good. The, the thing that I get concerned about, especially at junior level, though, is is – they're becoming an over reliance or a kind of a pendulum swing too far in the direction of pay to play, especially at junior level. And, and Dave just kind of touched on that. You've got the eighth initiatives, which are great, but it's essentially in, to be part of these academies, you've really got to have deep pockets. I, I do place some, some credence on you get what you pay for. Um, and that philosophy where, yeah, you know, if, you're being charged X amount of, of money uh, and that could be in, in, into the four figures for, for junior academy coaching. The expectation is that if you're paying that much money, you ought to be developing into an elite player or an elite prospect. Um, so it, it shouldn't be too surprising that, and, and not necessarily a negative either, that a bulk of the kids who are getting selected for these kind of events are going to be from ace academies going forward because that's the the top dollar uh top ticket um price tag in terms of junior coaching and junior academy structure in in this country and you're you're again you're getting what you're paying for you're getting access to, to high caliber high echelon coaches you expect to get a good return on that investment the negative is that if, if you if you get too deeply entrenched in that you're going to potentially miss out you're, you're you're going to potentially price out players or families who are exceptionally athletically talented but who just don't have the money and and they're right. not um they're not being sponsored they're not being subsidized um there's no kind of like scholarship structure in, in that sense like like you do have in the ncaa scholarship uh, structure with the basketball sure. football where you know you have a lot of um players uh, from from a lot of NCAA sports who are, come from um, underprivileged backgrounds, the NCAA scholarship is a great level. Where you don't you don't have to be paying hand over fist and, and forking out you know your 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 mom and dad's pension and their four hundred one k in order to get an NCAA basketball scholarship or or to to forge your way on the path to a pro career. If you're good enough through the high school and into the NCAA structures, you get your NCAA scholarship paid for. And that's your right. pathway to get, get into um, professional sports here. Sure. What's, 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 what's positive about this tournament is that it's not, you know, MLC and MILC um, in some ways it could be argued those, those, the pathway to that is pay to play. You've got to get pay to play, pay to get into a, an ACE Academy to really be on the pathway to those things. The, the balance or the counterbalance that USA cricket uh, ostensibly is providing through this is the fact that, they are still providing, while, while a significant number of players who are getting picked for these squads are, unsurprisingly, ace academy kids, there is still scope for players who are, are not from uh, deep-pocketed families who will still be given opportunities to get evaluated, who um, are getting selected. They, they aren't going to fall, fall through the cracks or slip through the cracks. And they are going to get that opportunity, as Dave said, 
to, to test themselves on field and show that they are just as talented and just as capable of performing as the ACE Academy kids. And it, you don't, you don't necessarily have to be playing for an ACE Academy and, and paying, uh, you know, thousands of dollars a month or tens of thousands of dollars a year to be on the pathway to USA national team representation. And you're not going to fall through the cracks, but there is still a safety net there that other people are watching you, evaluating you, and you're getting that chance to compete and measure yourself against other players from all sorts of backgrounds and, and you aren't going to be ignored. So I think that that in itself is, is a positive aspect of the fact that the national governing body is still in charge of these events and it's not exclusively being organized by the, the commercial partner. Right. And, and another, another barrier that exists in spite of all this is the youth programs. Uh, there's not everybody who's even in this event plays for even a youth side. Uh, for right. example, there's a player in the East who's, whose brother I know, Derek Persaud, and his family uh, lives in Albany, I think. And that's where he plays his cricket. And there's not a youth, youth club for him there. He plays in the regular adult league. And so when you have these zonal trials and things like that, a player like him can, can show up. You know, they can, they can make their way onto a zonal team, which is what, what has happened. So, so that's, that's definitely a good thing. Dave, the, the Mid-Atlantic and the East Zones, um, so there's not much turf in, in, those, in those areas, as you know. There's, there's no turf. There's no turf. <laughs> right. <laughs> not not many. Not the period. You 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 gotta you gotta get on a flight to Guyana, right? You gotta get on a flight to Guyana, Jamaica, Trinidad, Barbados, wherever it is. You go yeah. for it. Do you think even India? We 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 trying to go to New Zealand and Australia soon. Oh, I, nice. Some of the boys have actually went to England. Well, hopefully they'll get some turf of their own. How far behind the eight ball are they going into a tournament where basically three games are gonna decide where you where you end up? I don't know. I've been around Mid-Atlantic guys for so long. I, I will put Mid-Atlantic at the top to win this. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I know I know everybody is saying this turf, 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 but Mid-Atlantic guys got a lot of experience right. behind them. They have played in many tournaments, very competitive. They went to all over. So I will put Mid-Atlantic up there against uh, anybody. I mean, it's of course, it's going to be tough. But Mid-Atlantic guys are thing. New York, on the other hand, the East, the East. I I'm so used to to, to so they, you know. But New York is under. I mean, the East is. Um, I know much of the kids too, but they don't have as much exposure as I will say as Mid Atlantic or the rest, you know. But they are. I mean, two two guys that I know, batting wise is Taha and Mohammed Shah, the captain. Mm-hmm. Those are two guys to watch out for, in my opinion, from right. the East, you know, but, but they can, I, I don't, I mean, a lot of people always talk about turf, turf, turf. Yes, they have a lot to do with it, but these guys have played a lot of cricket and they, they know what to expect. Right. They're not, you know, and I think they can adapt. I think they can make the adaption. Right, uh, especially Taha. Taha was in um, in Pakistan training, I think, for a good four months or so. He right. just came back for the tournament, so he should be ready and should be re- uh, ready to adapt to the the condition over there. So, so when they came out with the the zonal rosters, I looked at them, and um, of course, I think everybody looked at them and had their opinions about the the groups. And then they did a a reshuffle, and honestly, reshuffle a kind of addressed a problem I had perceived at the time of a little bit of in, in, imbalance with group a having probably a, a, a what looked the like top on paper. teams. Yeah. It yeah. looked like on paper to have the strong, the top team. So now they've rebalanced it. So that group a has the mid East, the uh, West blue team, the South and the Colts and group B has East Midwest, Southwest and West red. And so it looks like a lot of people may have uh, perceived that as well, or at least USA did. Um, but this no, I, I I think the complaint. I think soon as it came out, the complaint started. I didn't honestly. The art of criticism Dave, started. When is there a time that people aren't complaining, Dave? Come on, <laughs> no, 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 no. But you know, the criticism started, and I think they took a look into it, 
and they realize, okay, maybe they made him, you know, I, yeah. I don't know, because when they, they send the amendment, uh, thing, I was like, oh, they change it around. I, you know, because I know there was talk behind the scenes. I was actually shocked. I didn't see many people complaining about it on Facebook, um, which is usually the place where everybody, you know, gets together on, on things. But <laughs> I think Come on, is, man. I, you got to rally the troops. I, I think <laughs> this one tournament everybody's looking forward to. So they're going to take they're going to take uh, whatever they get, you know. Yeah, so, everybody is looking forward to it. I I, I agree. You, you um, know, like I, one guy asked me, called me about the lawsuit kind of thing. And I'm like, listen, man, y'all need to stop wearing it. Just get the goddamn under 19 rolling and you'll see how <laughs> everybody start stop talking about the lawsuit. <laughs> it, it, yeah. You know, so at the end of the day, I think we're just happy for this tournament to take it to get started. And again, everybody have players from all over who is their favorite, you know. So yeah. now's the time for show who is who. So, so Dave, do you want to be bold and give a prediction here for the group uh, group leaders? Uh, I'm going with Mid Atlantic. I don't know. I know Peter with me. I'm Mid Atlantic. Are you with me, Peter? <laughs> as as a group leader? As a group leader, yeah. Uh, I said, well, I think the X Factor is played. That will be the as, that will be the game on Monday. Everybody's talking about that game. As good as, as good as a lot of these kids are. The, the the reality is the top to bottom depth in a lot of these squads isn't quite there. Just just from a sheer numbers standpoint, there, there isn't the raw volume of players to really extract top to bottom depth across the board from squad to squad. And it, it opens the door for, for one player to be a, a, a game breaker and a game changer. And theoretically, you could have uh, – uh, below average uh, standard of, of player top to bottom in the cool squad, but all, all it would take is just the one player play Van Staden who could be an equalizer. Realistically speaking, again, as good as uh, the mid-Atlantic zone players are, I don't think he's going to be necessarily intimidated by the bowling he's going to face this week compared to what he may uh, be seeing on a regular basis in South Africa. Uh, I think the biggest challenge to overcome for him is just simply adjusting to the, the prayer review pitch because he's never played on it before. Uh, right. And even even for a high caliber player, uh, those things do take a level of adjustment period. But in terms of in terms of top to bottom depth, can just simply be a matter of one or two stand up players affecting. Theoretically, yeah, Mid Mid Atlantic might have better pl players for U.S. standards on paper, but do they have a high 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 class individual standout star? Uh, like the Colts team does with, with Slade Van Stad and his captain. I mean, if you look at the Mid-Atlantic team, you've got um, Simon Kamala, who really impressed me when he played for USA Under-19 back uh, two summers ago. And having somebody with that experience definitely helps. I know Yasser Mohammed or Yasser, Yasser Syed uh, is somebody who Pubudu Dasanayak was really, really high on. And now he's in the mix, not just for Mid-Atlantic, but for potentially pushing for a spot in the USA Under-19 team. Uh, so, so they've got some good players there. You know, funny things can happen in, in these in these events. You know, you guys touched on it uh, a few minutes ago that you know it's it's really tough. There's going to be some big decisions made basically off of three games. It's it's three games and then your 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 playoff round match. And I know a lot of people think that's unfair. How, how can you pick a, a a squad based off of just just three days of cricket or four days of cricket? They should be really using uh, a more extended time frame and evaluating these guys on on a full season of, of games in their regions and a, a full season of games or two full seasons of games and what if they just have one bad weekend you can't just ignore a guy or or, or omit a guy for a selection for the usa under 19 spud just because of one bad weekend me personally i'm a believer in it and i felt this way with when they had the combine system in place with the icc i'm a big believer in the pressure aspect of these events yeah you can say oh well this guy scores thousand runs in local cricket he scored a thousand runs in a season he was you know and he just had one bad weekend well to me that says when all eyes were on him you know there's not a lot of people watching you find your regional cricket in new jersey right. or new york or north carolina or california where there's not really too many people watching those games the pressure is is very low right when all eyes are on you you've got all the selectors watching you national sledges you got all the coaches you've got media contention however big or small the media contention is but um, media representation that are really focusing on you 
in a very specific <laughs> manner. You got to rise to the, the occasion. You got to rise to the pressure. And some kids, and, and, not, and not just kids, men too, when the combine system was in place, the national championship systems have been in place in Gusaka, um, in, in past years, when, when that pressure is on on those three days and you've got three chances and three matches to perform and it all comes down to those three matches, you can't fall on the excuse of, oh, he just had one bad weekend. Oh, it's not fair. He's, right. he's a consistent run score for three or four years. Well, this is when the pressure was on. This is when it mattered. This is when you have to score. And some people just don't have that mental strength in those situations. And to me, that's the biggest test. Sure, sure. An event like this. Not as oh, too. this guy's technique is so good, and this guy's technique is great. You should right. see his technique all your own. He's got the best technique. Technique doesn't mean anything if you don't have the me- mental um, strength and the mental yep. mental game to go with it. And that's what I look for. The John and, McEnroe and, and, mindset. And, and that's one of the reason. And that's one of the reason we haven't been able to compete with Canada, talent wise, on talent and skills wise. I think we were right up there, probably even better, but we didn't have the mental capacity to compete with them. Peter, I think you was there that that one year. Uh, I went up there to watch the game, and it was more of a mental thing than skills that we lost that game against Canada when uh, two years, not the last qualifier, twenty seventeen, yeah, where yeah. they played it at the, the skating and curling club. Yeah, I, I would yeah. agree with that. I would wholeheartedly yeah. agree with that. That, that yeah, the, the the difference in talent, there is no difference. The USA kids are just as talented as the Canada kids uh, at that age level. And uh, there's, there's no real great talent disparity. Uh, the two key things in my mind have always been the Canadian kids are playing more, much more consistently on turf compared to the U.S. kids on a, on a regular basis. And yeah, the, the mental standpoint, they're, because they're playing a, a consistently higher standard of, of league cricket, that, that Toronto District and Cricket Association, it, I think is a much higher standard league, much more intense league, than a lot of the players in the U.S. play on a regular basis. Um, you've got the quality of the facility playing on, on turf wickets regularly that the Canada kids do a lot more than the U.S. kids. Hopefully that's changing now with ACE developing a lot more infrastructure so that more players, both at men and, and junior level, are going to get more opportunities and women's level uh, to play on, on uh, turf wickets more regularly. But also, yeah, the mental standpoint, their challenge in higher pressure situations more regularly than the American kids do. And uh, when it comes down to a final day scenario where everything's on the line, it wasn't just 2017, Dave. It was, it was that way in 2019. The yeah, US yeah. that's what I was like, 2017, the for sure, in 2019, go, for sure. Go back, you know, 2011, 20, um, you know, 2011 in Ireland, USA had a, a, a place in the World Cup on the line. If, if they won, they were essentially going to clinch a spot when uh, Greg Sudial was captain uh, out of New York and they choked in Ireland at the qualifier in Ireland, uh, 20, 2013, Steven Taylor captain that team again in a, in a pressure situation, the U S kids crumbled. And uh, you know, even though on paper you would say, well, USA had Steven Taylor, Canada kids don't have a player capable of matching that kind of talent. The Canadian kids with Nick Hill Dutta, I remember in particular in 2013, when the pressure was on, they were able to perform. And I think some people would find it shocking that USA had Stephen Taylor play in an under-19 World Cup at age 15 in 2010. And yet Stephen Taylor was part of the under-19 uh, crop in 2011 and 2013. And USA didn't qualify either time because there wasn't enough depth of talent around Stephen Taylor and that mental strength with the talent that was existing, just just wasn't there to compete with the the Canadian well, kids. Well, yeah, this thing needs to improve. And this 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 tournament gives players a chance to realize how they can perform under this type of pressure, and then adapt. You know, learn from it because you have to learn that you're bad at it if you are bad at it before you can fix it. So, th- so more I, more things like this is better in my mind. I remember when I went to 2017 and watched a final in Canada, and I I tell everybody that I came back. I was like. Man, you, we have to work on our kids for the, the next World Cup, which was 2019. Not talent-wise, the mental strength. And I remember one day we, when we went against uh, the, the two, I don't want to say weaker team, but yeah, the two weaker team, everybody was happy. I'm like, stop, don't get excited. Because we need our boys to be mentally strong for the Canada. 
and we went yeah. into that team and right away I, I, I saw it. They 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 froze. Well, well and, and and again on and just put on, on to build on Dave's point right there. Um on the mental strength point, I think just the mental uh, uh approach to batting and mental stamina with batting in particular. And this is something I think that that's exciting that perhaps uh, Slave and Saturn will bring to the table is the fact that, like I said before, you know, when we were first talking about Slave and Saturn, kids in America, oh, I got 50. Wow, I've mean, I, I done something special. Um, like <laughs> the concept of scoring 100 is foreign. Like it, it's not even right. like uh, a target. Um, right. And so in, those, in, in that match that, that Dave is referencing in particular in 2017, they will remember Arslan Khan, the Canadian captain. Like that guy was hungry for runs. That guy had knuckled down and refused to die, and he put a high price on his wicket. And he was scoring fifties and hundreds, and right. he wanted to bet yeah. long. And he had this hunger, and it was like, I'm not throwing my wicket away. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna keep batting and keep batting and keep batting. And they had other guys on the team like Akash Gill, um, was a stand-up player and, and is a rising star. And th- those kind of players, they just have this hunger and this mental development in terms of their batting where like they don't get excited by scoring 30 or right. get scoring 40 and oh i've done something i've scored 40 and if you look at that scorecard and, and you know again dave was there like the top scores that usa made that day i think were in the 30s right. nobody made big big scores and that's yeah, really never been an wrong. issue nobody well, it's right. never been an issue for the canadian kids right um compared to the u.s kids so if you again you look at the played ben Scott and He's not somebody who's going to be satisfied with, oh, I scored 35 today. Like, I'm, uh, I'm right. really feeling good about myself. If he scores 35, he's going to, he's going to be, you know, upset, hiding his face and, like, you know, covering his, his face when he goes back to his hotel room that night and, and be fuming. Um, this, this, this is somebody who I think can rub off on some of the other players around him, whether it's in the Colts team or just other players in the opposition in these squads and potentially uh, in USA under 19. He can rub off on them the, that um, mental approach where I'm not content scoring 40. I'm not yeah. content scoring 45 or 50. Like, I'm going to try for 100 every day. And even if I score 80, I, I, if, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the kids who come here this week will might, might think, like, oh, I scored 80 like this. I'm awesome. If Slade Van Staten scores 80, he's going to be disappointed. Sure. <laughs> he's going to be fuming going it, into his next inning. It, it reminds me of a conversation I had once with Alvin Kalacharan and he, he told me he really never, he really didn't get good until he stopped being happy with centuries and started trying to score double centuries. And I thought, wow, that's a whole nother level. <laughs> that's just, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, in, in the stratosphere, you know. One last thing, we'll talk about group B, people's choices for that, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, what do you, what do you, does anybody have a favorite pick for group B? The East, the Midwest, the Southwest, and the West Zone Red. Uh, I'm gonna go with this like this. Uh, the one that um, Rusty Tyrone is man. Uh, so that's coaches. the West West Red. <laughs> West Red. Yeah, yeah. That looks like a yeah. really good team. Yeah. Yeah, they they the top one and uh, the other the Texas team. That's how I'm gonna identify them. Gotcha. I think uh, most people are on that boat. Yeah, those are the top two teams for me. And the Colts and Mid Atlantic are the top two in the other one. But surprises can happen, man, because I know all these teams and most of these players they have most of these teams have two or three good players that can pull off something special. The Colts the Colts actually have a pretty decent team, man. This guy, Ashrim Ali, he's a left hand fast bowler. I heard I heard good things about him. I haven't got I haven't gotten to see him, but a lot of people say Quite a few people say he's pretty good. On paper, the the Reds, the West Zone Reds team looks stacked. Uh, specifically, uh, Sanjay Krishnamurti. You know what he did in the minor league uh, in the, during the exhibition season was named minor league MVP. He's only uh, seventeen, and, and he again formerly represented Karnataka underage group teams. Uh, it's pretty significant. Um, and talking with players on the West Coast, they've had really positive things to say about him. And then Rahul Jayawala, uh, again, former USA under-19 representative, was with the team in 2019 as a wicketkeeper. I was very impressed with him. I would say probably the two players I was most impressed with in terms of being prospects for the future, uh, long-term prospects, I, I would say were Rahul Jayawala and 
and Simon Kamala. Um, they both just look very physically mature for their ages. Right. I Sai is a kid who just physically looking at him, he, he looks like at the time he was 16 back in, in 20. He looks like he was 20 or 21. Rahul Jarawal, the same thing. He was 15 years old at the time as a wiki hero. He was a high school freshman. And physically, he, he reminded me of Stephen Taylor in the sense that when Stephen Taylor was 15 years old and he made his debut as a 16-year-old for USA Men, Stephen Taylor at 15 years old looked like he was like 24, 25 physically. <laughs> he, was, he, was six, he was six foot, six foot one. He was very, very muscular, very mature for his age. Um, the only way that you knew Stephen Taylor was 15 or 16 was when he opened his mouth and he, you heard him talking and he talked like a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then you realize he was quite young, but just looking at him physically, you, you, you would think, man, this, he's a man. He's a grown man. Right. Um, Rahul, Jar- Rahul Jariwal, the same thing. He was, I think he might've been the youngest player in the team that was in Canada, 15 year old, two years ago. And yet he looks like physically he was the oldest player there. He was just so physically imposing as a 15 year old. And so, um, you know, you have players like that on paper and the experience factors that those guys have and a, and a lot of the um, training that those guys are getting out of the ACE Academy in, in Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, but Southwest, I, I actually think Southwest, would, uh, I have them as a fair bit in that group, just simply by virtue of the fact that um, not only do they have uh, three players coming back who are USA under 19 representatives in Ali Sheikh, Abi Ramvali Samagari, and Raymond Dar, um, it's simply the fact that it's just their home field. you got to put right. a lot of stock into that. I put a lot of stock into it anyway. The fact right. that um, a lot of these guys have a hell of a lot more experience playing on these Prairie View wickets than anybody else in the country does. Right. Um, not, not a lot of people have had access or exposure to this Prairie View facility. It's only been really up and running for the last year and a half, two years maybe. Mm-hmm. And these guys have a very significant edge in the in – the, um, Because uh, they're the home team. Yeah, they're, the, they're the home team. They, yeah. they, they, they've just got the exposure to the facility itself and the conditions. So in a, in a tournament, a short form tournament, where a team, say for example, like New York, players from New York may not have, uh, they may have turf experience on overseas tours, but they may not have ever played in Prairie View before. That's a, that's a stiff challenge to overcome in, in three days, and I put a lot of stock into that in in favoring Southwest over any other team in the tournament for that reason. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good safe bet. Um, my my own opinions are I think I think the South is gonna is gonna do pretty well. Obviously, a, a little bit of a homer pick there, um, but a little. I a little. I wouldn't be surprised to see I wouldn't be surprised to see them do very well with the with the with the players they have who have uh, some some good turf uh, experience. Also, they've got two of probably the best leggies on the team. Uh, Adam Khan and uh, Adi Gupta, and I think those two young leggies are 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 gonna gonna push for the for uh, the U19 team, and they're both on the same team. So so we'll see. They they have turf experience. They've got uh, some good players. They're up against some some very good teams. Um, but I wouldn't count them out. And it, as far as Group B, I gotta agree with Peter in a tournament where three games make make your you know make your tournament that the Southwest ha- has to have a little bit of an edge there, but the West Reds- is actually pretty good though, man. I'm looking at this list again. They are, they are pretty good. Yeah. They're a great, they're a good team. And, and the West West Reds are a very good team too. They've got a lot of turf experience on their own. Of course, it's, it's, it's a different, it's a different wicket altogether, but still. So those two teams to me look like the strongest. I think it's going to be a great experience for the Midwest uh, team, the East team for, for all the teams. I think it'll be great. Uh, I know, um, you know, Midwest seems to be like a, a rising uh, zone the way I see it. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm really, really excited to see how things go and hopefully there'll be some surprises. But guys, I, I want to wrap it up. I really appreciate you talking with me and I'm hopefully we can talk again uh, later in the week as the tournament goes on and kind of reflect on things. Monday it is, brothers. Perfect timing, Nate, because the Gonzaga UCLA game is about to go into overtime for his oh. national championship. <laughs> Monday <Priority. it> is. <laughs> I cannot wait for Monday. Monday will be the be two, the, one of the biggest games. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a great. It's going to be there'll be three games Monday. It's going to be tough on Tuesday. There will be two teams that are two games into their tournament, two thirds of the way through. So that's going to be 
quite quite a thing. Um, so we'll know a lot right away. What by Wednesday there'll be a totally different picture. Anybody doing a prediction of who the starting eleven is with Colts and Mid Atlantic? <laughs> That's some deep stuff. I think uh, it's too late in Peter's day for that. If you get yeah, if, you that if, if you get that, Dave, then I tell you what, you can pick my Mega Millions numbers for me in the hundred. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna do it tomorrow. I'm gonna do it tomorrow. <laughs> All right, do it. Put it up on Facebook. I want to see it. Of course, I'll do it tomorrow because those that's the game I'm looking at tomorrow uh, on Monday. Game I'm looking at Monday is Baylor versus UCLA or Gonzaga. Whoever wins this second semifinal here. All right. <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about, man. All I'm All right. focusing on is this U19. Too bad. I'm, I'm on Patel's not on the call. This would go another 30 minutes. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and please watch this space for more this week on the USA Men's Under-19 National Championship.